This is 1988 Tops, where every card has a story to tell. Your hosts are David McKellis and Matt Kuzma. Let's play ball. Welcome back to 1988 Tops. David, what's our card for this week? Matt, we have three cards this week. Oh my. Where do I begin? We have Ernie Riles, number 88. Ernie Riles, shortstop third baseman for the Milwaukee Brewers. We have Ernie Riles, number 93T, his traded card with the San Francisco Giants. And we have the the Hackman Revisited, Jeffrey Leonard, number 61T, outfielder for the Milwaukee Brewers. Always a pleasure when we can knock out a significant number of cards. We're knocking years off of this podcast. A triple card episode is just so highly efficient, very pleasing. So very excited for this one. But I'm I'm a little confused, David, because we've done Jeffrey Leonard before. So why why did we have these cards? I'm not sure if anyone noticed that we missed something last week. And huh? <laughs> shamefully, this is the second time in 2022 that we missed out on the RBI corner and had to revisit it. Sorry mm. to Brian. We finished recording and almost immediately I texted Brian and I said, is Scott Geraltz in RBI baseball? We're going to have to revisit this next week. <laughs> so we had this one in the queue, sort of, because a couple months ago, our friend Andy over at High Heat Stats tweeted about a an 80s Fleer card. And he said, 1985 Fleer update, U89, Ernie Riles. This player was known as Ernie Riles with no A and Ernest Riles, but not Ernie with an A, typo on Fleer's part. Mm-hmm. And then in response to that, friend of the show, Upper Deck 1990 at U Deck 1990 on Twitter mm-hmm. said, Tops cards also spelled it that way for several years. 1988 Tops, can we get an investigation? So he was looking for an investigation. We were looking for a way to shoehorn Jeffrey Leonard into an episode. And this traded card, the reason for this traded card is that Ernie Riles was traded for Jeffrey Leonard. So we're able to knock out that old Jeffrey Leonard card because we did his episode before we had added in the traded set. And it gives us a chance to talk about RBI baseball and the San Francisco Giants where Jeffrey Leonard and Scott Gereltz were on the same team. We got the whiteboard up here. If you're following (laughs) along at home with your red string, that's how we're connecting these cards. It is a tenuous connection. We're happy to get this investigation started. So let's start with Ernie Riles and card 88 and go into the front here. We have Ernie Riles on the Brewers. This is a good looking card to me. Ernie looks great here. He's he's in the batter's box. He's kind of stretching. He's got this excellent blue helmet. This Brewers jersey, as we've discussed before, is really sharp looking. The gray Brewers jersey with the Milwaukee in script, the two tone blue and yellow script really pops. Also, one thing you notice is that he's got his hat underneath his helmet, kind of like back when you're in Little League and you're afraid to set your hat down somewhere because you might lose it. I do like the color scheme. Love the yeah the the hat underneath the helmet. He's he's smushing that that hat down he's gonna ruin the crown of that cap he's got a scruffy kind of facial hair look he's got the good eye black going on so i like this card now let's go to the back of 88 and we have ernie riles shortstop and third baseman height 6'1 weight 180 left-handed batter and thrower drafted by the brewers in the third round of 1981 born october 2nd 1960 in cairo georgia with a home in wiggum georgia I did look this up because as Illinoisans, we know of Cairo, Illinois, and do not call it Cairo, Illinois, even though it is named after the city in Egypt. I wanted to look this up to get some perspective and a Georgian's perspective, and I found an article by Johnny Vardaman, a Georgian's pronunciation guide, and Johnny talks about towns like Hoshton and Brazelton and Demoris. I'm probably pronouncing all of those wrong. And Georgia also, like Illinois, has a Vienna. Mm. Vienna, not Vienna. And then Johnny gets down to Cairo. 
he say says it has always been a curiosity. People who don't know South Georgia usually pronounce Cairo like the one in Egypt, Cairo. But this one is pronounced K-A-Y-R-O-W. He says Cairo, Georgia is famous for making syrup. Although syrup apparently hasn't been made on a large scale since the 1990s. So they, but they were nicknamed the syrup makers. The town <laughs> slogan is where life is sweeter. And mm. the city's website at the time was syrupcity.net. It reminds me of my other podcast about pancakes and other accoutrement called Short Stack. Do you have a Short Stack sub stack? <laughs> I do have a Short Stack, a Short Stack sub stack. We'll leave that breakfast discussion for another time. Other famous folks from Cairo, Mac Robinson, an Olympic silver medalist at the 1936 Olympic Games and older brother of Jackie Robinson, born in Cairo but moved to Pasadena. California as a small child. Curly Williams. Curly Williams was not his his given name. His given name was Doc. As Curly was the seventh son born in his family, there was an old adage that the seventh son would become a doctor. So maybe they thought he would be a doctor. Maybe they just had seven sons and ran out of boys' names. So (laughs) instead... Instead of becoming a doctor, he was a country singer, now enshrined in the Country Music Hall of Fame. He wrote one of my favorite songs, uh, the song Half As Much, made famous by Hank Williams, the the senior, senior Hank Williams. Also, Teresa Edwards, Basketball Hall of Famer and four-time Olympic gold medalist. And finally, Ernie Ryle's nephew and 2005 White Sox World Series winning run scorer, Willie Harris also from Cairo, Georgia. So three major leaguers, Willie Harris, Ernie Riles, and Jackie Robinson, all born in Cairo. The name listed on this card is Ernie with an A. Other famous Ernies with an A, Ernie Stewart, former professional soccer player and current sporting director of World Cup qualified U.S. soccer. Boxer Ernie Shavers, who Muhammad Ali once called the hardest puncher he ever faced. But this Ernie... Ernie Riles often went by Ernest with no A and often in other cards was listed as Ernie, E-R-N-I-E. So it's really unclear why they added an A if that was something in the Brewer's program manual. But most places that I've searched online, it is listed as E-R-N-I-E. So maybe it's in the top style guide to add an A. However, some Fleer cards also have him listed as Ernest, E A. R-N-E-S-T. Topps switched the spelling to Ernie with no A in 1989 and kept that until his last card. So from what I can find now, he goes by Ernest on Facebook, E-R-N-E-S-T. Lots of spelling in this one. (laughs) Other famous Ernests with no A's. We have Jack Worthing, known as Ernest from Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Ernest, who was sick to death of cleverness. Also another... The importance of being Ernest going to camp, Ernest P. Worrell. Mm. And we will see if this Ernest, Ernest Riles, uh, goes to camp, joins the army, is scared stupid, has a slam dunk, (laughs) Yeah, is back in action. How many more Ernest movies are there? I can. How many of those videos do you have in your home? Me, zero. My brother at one point, I think, had all of them. And a friend of the show, Sasha, I know owns many Ernest movies. Ernest held a place of infamy in my, in my home. My brother and I categorized Ernest with, along with Gallagher and Carrot Top as our least favorite comedians of the era. Well, that's, that is unfortunate because all of those guys were, well, at least Carrot Top and Jim Varney were involved in fantastic movies. I know Carrot Top's chairman of the board was, <laughs> I think, probably recognized uh, with a Lifetime Achievement Award this year at the Oscars. <laughs> Jim Varney's character, Ernest P. Worrell, started as an advertising campaign, and he would talk to uh, an off-screen person named Vern, and he would advertise all kinds of different things. Unfortunately, Jim passed away, so we don't get to see a 2022 Ernest movie. I would would love to see the gritty origin story of Ernest. (laughs) Other Ernests, Ernie of Burton Ernie, Ernest Hemingway, Ernie Ells, Chicago favorite Ernie Banks, and Ernie Nevers, who was an inaugural member of both the Pro and College Football Halls of Fame and also played Major League Baseball from 1926 to 1928. 
This Ernest, nicknamed Easy E or Easy Ernie, or just called Easy by his teammates, who he engages with on Facebook a lot. So a lot of uh, like Otis Nixon and Joey Meyer commenting on his pictures. It's, it's great to see some of these old names show up and know that they're still friends with good old Ernie Riles. Ernie went to Bainbridge High School and wasn't really scouted by the pros out of Bainbridge High School. So he went to a junior college, Middle Georgia Junior College. And I had not heard of Middle Georgia College, but they had a really great baseball program for a junior college. Lots of major leaguers who we will talk about in this podcast. Jody Davis, Cal Daniels, Josh Reddick, and Sean Hillegas, and as well as Ernie's nephew, Willie Harris. Riles led that Middle Georgia College team to consecutive junior college world series championships in 1979 and 1980 and in 1980 he was named the world series most valuable player for middle georgia and he was picked in the 21st round after that season by the mariners but he didn't sign so then in the january draft he's picked by the brewers with their third round selection signs a contract and goes off to rookie league at butte montana And Ernie said about Butte that he experienced a kind of cold that he never had felt before. And I can imagine that growing up in Georgia, then going to Butte, Montana. And it must have been a pretty good motivator for him because he made the all-star team in rookie league, hit 348, and we're guessing probably never went back to Montana after that. (laughs) The next year, he ended up at Stockton, continued to hit well, 286, 21 steals in 138 games, playing all those games at shortstop. As you said about Butte, Montana, I think we talked about this with Julio Franco, that maybe this was some kind of proving ground where they would just send guys off into the the middle of nowhere and be like, all right, are you going to make it out or are you going to head back home? And it seems like a, a a cruel twist there. But yeah, like you said, he made it to Stockton, continued to play well on the offensive side of the ball. On defense, he was playing shortstop. He made 37 errors, so he was still maturing as a defensive player. But he earned a promotion to El Paso at AA, where he further developed defensively and also continued to destroy lower-level pitching and earned himself a couple of fun facts. Yeah, that's right. He led the Texas League with a 349 average, 166 for 476, and topped loops shortstops with 638 chances accepted and 77 double plays at El Paso in 1983. Once again, tops showing their math in calculating the batting average and all, and a new thing of chances accepted. <laughs> yeah, is there a, an opportunity to decline a chance? No, thank you. No, thank no, you. Thank I will. You. I do not accept this chance. <laughs> I don't, I don't understand. Interesting use of capitalization on averages, chances accepted, and double plays. Apparently, all of those are proper nouns. Is this being translated from the German, where they, so. like all, all of the nouns are capitalized? Yes, and gendered, yeah. <laughs> gendered articles yeah, as well. <laughs> so, aside from the strange editorial choices by the Tops Corporation, a pretty good year for Ernie. On top of that, three forty nine average. He had thirteen homers, ninety one RBIs, so showing a little bit more power as well as a good eye, 86 walks. Yeah, and these lines are all on the card. So we go to 1984, where he ends up at Triple A Vancouver. In 19, it slowed down a little bit. In 84, he hit only 267 and didn't really show any power. And it also looks like he was blocked at the big league level by a certain future Hall of Famer at shortstop in the Brewers organization. <laughs> The Brewers had Robin Yount a couple years removed from his MVP season. It may have been disheartening for Ernie to see that his competition at the big league level was pretty immovable. And so in 1985, he started really strong. He hits 347 through 30 games in Vancouver, but he also had a little bit of good luck on his part, maybe bad luck on Robin Yount's part. Robin Yount had injury troubles and multiple shoulder injuries and surgeries that led the Brewers to move him to the outfield. So starting that season, the Brewers have Brian Giles, not the very good Pirates player from the 90s, but this guy who ended up hitting 172, as well as Ed Romero as their starting shortstops. And Romero was a career utility player. So Ernie's playing really well at Vancouver, gets called up in May, slotted in at shortstop, and his emergence and a really good season made Yount's move to the outfield a little bit more palatable for the Brewers. 
Yeah, it really makes the general manager and the management look good that they were flexible in moving their players around like this. And it leads to a very impressive rookie year for Ernie Riles. Ernie appeared in 116 games. He was okay on defense. It's not like he was Robin Yount and a gold glove winner, but he was decent. On offense, on the other hand, he was solid. He ended up at 286 with five homers, seven triples, and 45 RBIs for his rookie year. He ends up finishing third in Rookie of the Year voting after another shortstop, Ozzie Guillen, and teammate, pitcher Teddy Higuera. So going into the 1986 season, a Sporting News article was going through the best shortstops in the American League, and Ernie's included in that, coming off that strong rookie season. He's a couple steps below some future Hall of Famers, guys like Cal Ripken and and Alan Trammell. But he's also listed up there with Tony Fernandez and Ozzie Guillen, who had just won the Rookie of the Year. So good things are expected. He hits nine home runs, but his average dropped a little bit to 252. His defense, again, was okay. His errors were down, but his range was also down a little bit. So he's not quite replacement level at shortstop just yet. Late in that season, some trade rumors came up, and it was suggested that the A's were looking at Ernie and maybe wanted to bring him in as their shortstop of the future, but nothing materialized. So before Ernest goes to camp, to training camp in 1987, we have a very strange injury, David. In January, Ernie hurts his hand. On the 1988 Donruss card, it says that he had a broken hand, but it was a little bit stranger than that. He was at home in January and went to grab a glass from his cupboard, and it started to fall. And so he saw saw this falling, and maybe knowing that Ernie made a few errors in his day, he he definitely made one here, not quite sure-handed as we would like to see from a shortstop. He dropped the glass on the counter, and it shattered, cutting his hand. He thought it was just a cut, so he stops the bleeding, but then he couldn't feel his hand. He underwent two-plus hours of surgery on severed tendons and damaged nerves in his hand. This surgery was said to to keep him out for up to three months while he was rehabbing. So a public service announcement, stay away from broken glass. I read this and cringed as a former bartender. I've been around a lot of, a lot of broken glass and had my fair share of cuts and stitches. So Ernie couldn't swing a bat or throw a ball for three months. The Brewers expected him back in in May in the minors for rehab. They didn't want to rush him back and suggested that he might be out until the All-Star break. He ends up losing his starting spot to Dale Svaim. Unfortunately for Ernie, the Brewers started out really hot, winning their first 13 games. This was known as Team Streak, and Dale Svaim started well and had a career year. He hit 25 home runs and 95 RBIs, truly a rabbit ball miracle for Dale. And rumors again swirled that Ernie could be traded when he was back and healthy. So he rehabs at AA El Paso, hits an outstanding 340 in 41 games, and is called back in late June, finishes up the season with Milwaukee. But he was playing mostly at third base because fame was the hot hand at shortstop. He hits 261, four home runs, and wasn't traded yet. Yeah, the Brewers in 87 finished with 91 wins and a solid showing. They finished third in the American League East. And so hoping to build on that 1987 season, we go into 1988. The team still has Paul Molitor, Robin Yount, Rob Deere, along with pitchers Teddy Higuera, Dan Plesak, Chris Bazio. This should be a pretty good team. But unfortunately, they had the second best ERA in the American League. The hitting, aside from some of those stars, it really suffered. So starters B.J. Serhoff, Dale Sveim, Greg Brock all had OPS pluses below 80. Joey Meyer, who is coming off that future Stars card, is not the star that they expected. Ernie's still playing at third, filling in when Molitor is DH. He's hitting okay, but the team is really looking for another big bat. So the trade is struck with the Giants. The Giants are two and a half games out of the National League West League in contention to repeat as division champs, and we have the mystery trade. That was what Sports Illustrated called it. They were trying to figure out why you would trade a backup third baseman shortstop for the reigning NLCS MVP when your team is still in contention. Some of the explanation was given by the San Francisco management that Jeffrey Leonard, Hackman, 
as we know and love him, was a free agent at the end of the season. And he was making $900,000 a year and was 32 years old. The Giants wanted to save some money. They had Mike Aldretti, who was pretty good in 1987, and he was going to be a future regular outfielder for them. And so they were looking for some infield help. And also, as one scout said, Jeffrey Leonard is fine if he's playing every day, but he's not the kind of guy you want unhappily sitting on your bench. And as we recall from his episode, he could be a, a prickly character. Yeah, could have strong opinions and could show them show them in interesting ways. In fact, David, I think that you we found that anecdote from the Baseball Confidential book. Yes, in this book, there's a section, short section that's titled "Nasty Bat." And Matt, you're going to need to get the clacks on ready because mm-hmm. I'm I might do a swear. <laughs> Giant slugger Jeffrey Leonard figured out how to shut up talkative catchers who tried to break his concentration at the plate. He had a special bat. In place of his signature on the barrel of the bat were carved the words, <coughs> you. He took his stance and slowly waved the barrel in front of the catcher's face. Salty and prickly, the hack man. He leaned into his reputation a little bit. It was said by some scouts that maybe there was some malcontent in the giants dressing room and they wanted to maybe clear it out and so jeffrey leonard was on the trade block so the trade goes through this jeffrey leonard experiment excited the fans at first here's a legitimate star and big character coming into the team and sports writers at the time thought that the change of scenery would be good for hackman But really, the mood kind of turned. He had a negative war in the 94 games that he played with the Brewers. He hit 235 with a 270 on base percentage and a 350 slugging in those 94 games. And he played bad defense in left field. He was gone at the end of the year, off to Seattle for his final two seasons. And really bringing Jeffrey Leonard, a guy who didn't walk in, kind of based on the performance in the NLCS and his 1987 performance into a team that was already a big strikeout team was kind of a recipe for disaster for the Brewers. For the Giants, Ernie stuck around for a couple years in San Francisco. As we know, in 1989, they make the World Series, and we'll get to his performance in a little bit. But first, we should probably talk about these cards. Yeah, let's look at the traded cards, 93T for Ernie Riles and 61T for Jeffrey Leonard, and both of them painted caps. And our friend, Andrew, at Painted Cap, has has done the treatment on both of these. For Ernie Riles, he said, The artist's motivation traded by Brewers to Giants for Jeffrey Leonard, the Topps art techniques on Ernie, Cap Bill Perspective Projection, CBPP, obviously, Logo size expansion, LSE, and ringer T effect, RTE. <laughs> this card is very, very strange looking. He doesn't have a great look on his face. He looks very, he's kind of looking through you. The Giants logo is huge on the top of this hat. <laughs> this is not some of the better work that they've done. And the it's a cartoonish ringer around the neck there. Not a good look. The Leonard card he doesn't even have a hat. So it's just a painted shirt. Andrew, we got to we got to talk about this. There's no hat painted at all. Again, please follow at painted cap on Twitter. It's a source of great joy. Jeffrey Leonard's tops art techniques here. We have power collar striping, PCS, and jersey oblivion transition. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the background of this card is like a bright white and Jeffrey's jersey just kind of flows into it (laughs) yeah i mean it doesn't look like he's in the dugout it looks like he's you know maybe resting against the wall of a parking garage and (laughs) jeffrey's face and eye black and sneer we talked about his nickname on the jeffrey leonard episode his nickname was penitentiary face for the constant scowl that he had and we didn't love that nickname but He's really playing up his persona here, and you could really see him swinging that F.U. bat. No doubt about it. While the trade was not a blockbuster, Jeffrey Leonard in RBI baseball is a blockbuster. So let's go to the RBI corner to learn about Jeffrey Leonard and Scott Gereltz in the game. (laughs) 
And we're back in the RBI corner. Brian, this is a makeup episode. We had forgotten that Scott Geraltz was in RBI baseball and Jeffrey Leonard was back before this was a regular segment. So let's play two. Let's talk about the Giants and RBI baseball. And so the Giants, are they any good? Yes, I think the Giants are actually really good and one of my favorite teams to talk about because they're one of my favorite teams to play with. So if you look at RBI Baseball, you have 10 teams that you can choose. There's the all-star teams which are kind of cheap to use. There's the bottom feeders that you might use, for instance, if you wanted to handicap yourself, and that's pretty much just Houston and St. Louis. And then you have the top teams that if you're in real competition, I think you play with Detroit, Boston, California. Then there's the middle tier, and I think the Giants are actually – the best team of that middle tier and maybe closer to that top tier uh, than the other two. They're a very balanced team. They have great pitching and they have a very good lineup. The lineup has power pretty much across the board. From the two to seven slots, you've got some power, but you really need to bring in Harry Spillman off the bench at either the number one or the number eight spots. They have good balance between lefties and righties. The two best players are probably Will Clark and Chili Davis, but they're the number five and the number seven hitters. Not that much speed, but a little bit of speed with Jeffrey Leonard and Chili Davis. The pitching staff is the real strength. Kruko and Russell are awesome starters. They have tons of movement. They throw kind of slow. And then the fun thing is you get to bring Scott Gerelson off the bench, as we'll talk about in a second, and he throws very hard. So you get this great contrast of these soft tossers where you can both move in and out against righties and lefties, and then you get the hard thrower out of the bullpen. So yeah, the Giants are a good team and a team that I love to play with. Let's start with focusing on Jeffrey Leonard. How is he in the game? So Jeffrey Leonard's a really good player. He's the number three hitter for the Giants. He has a nice combination of speed and power. I think with the Giants, you don't have these massive home run hitters like a Reggie Jackson in the game, but you've got a number of a number of players that can hit home runs, and Jeffrey Leonard's right at the top of that list. Now, one of the unfortunate things in RBI baseball is that when you hit a home run, your player runs the bases at the same speed every time and has the same exact celebration every time. So you are unable to get the Jeffrey Leonard one flap down celebration <laughs> as he rounds the bases. Additionally, the players run very fast around the bases to accelerate that little interlude where the player hits the home run. Jeffrey Leonard, of course, especially in the in the NLCS in 87, walked very slow around the bases. And in RBI baseball, that's just not possible. You can do your own one flap down celebration in your living room if you wanted. <laughs> this is true. Hopefully no one's watching you, but the game will pick up. So you might have to pause really quickly so that you don't have a strike thrown on you um, as you're making your way around your living room. I think perfectly justified to hit the pause and dunk on your opponent. What about Scott Gerelts then? Scott Gerelts is a very hard thrower. He's one of the relievers in RBI baseball. You have two starters, two relievers. The two starters have better endurance. The two relievers don't. So Scott Gerelts is only going to be good for a couple of innings. But one of the hardest throwers in RBI baseball, in fact, had tied for the third fastest fastball. Number one on that list is, of course, 1988 Topps podcast favorite, Juan Berenguer. Number two is Nolan Ryan, who people might have heard of. And then tied for number three are Scott Gerelts. Roger Clemens, and another 1988 Topps podcast favorite, Tom Hankey, a wonderful aftershave spokesman. So Scott Gerelts is someone you bring in out of the bullpen as a reliever and try to get people out with a really fast fastball. So for both of these players, are you going to be playing them every time? Absolutely. There's no reason to take Jeffrey Leonard out of your lineup. There are a couple of spots, as I mentioned, the number one and number eight spots that you probably want to swap out uh, and get Harry Spillman in the lineup for the Giants. But you want to keep Jeffrey Leonard in in the number three slot. And then Scott Gerelts, you're probably not going to start Scott Gerelts, but probably your first reliever is Scott Gerelts or Don Robinson. And when you need a fastball, you need to get through an inning. Maybe you've got some really good hitters up. Scott Gerelts is a great change of pace from the starters. So definitely use both Jeffrey Leonard and Scott Gerelts. And they're really, they're basically pillars of the San Francisco team. They're players that you would rely on uh, to try to win a game. As a follow-up, Brian, do you have any famous Ernie's that you wanted to raise with the pod? Well, I also serve as our pro wrestling correspondent, as you're aware of. And I can think of two pro wrestlers offhand. Uh, one is Ernest the Cat Miller from the late 1990s in WCW. Uh, I think he also wrestled a little bit in the early 2000s in WWF. And he, you know, had kind of a dancing routine. Is actually kind of a renowned martial artist, but would come in and have various gimmicks through the years that were really colorful. And then, of course, the big cat, Ernie Ladd, an NFL football player who then went on to star in pro wrestling, I think across the 60s and 70s, and I believe was the 
Booker in the Mid South Territory. Uh, so he was the one who was basically setting up the matches for many years. Uh, a giant man, I think he's about six seven or six eight, and one of one of the stars of that era. So a number of Ernie's in pro wrestling. Somehow they both have cats connected to their names, but nevertheless, they are two famous Ernie's that I think deserve deserves some mention well you are the most earnest video game and wrestling analyst in the business brian so thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you next time wonderful to be here thanks guys Ernie finished up 1988 with the San Francisco Giants and while Hackman was worth a negative 1.1 war for the Brewers Ernie over his 79 games that season with the Giants was valued at 2.2 war not known for his great defense in Milwaukee he was valued at 1.3 wins above replacement just on the defensive side he played well splitting time at third and second and a little bit of time at shortstop and on July 9th he had a true highlight. Yeah, he hits his first home run as a giant. It was in the middle of a 21-2 win over John Tudor and the Cardinals. But this home run ball had some controversy. The ball was hit off the upper deck in the outfield, bounces back onto the field, and Tom Bernanski in the Cardinals outfield tosses the ball to a guy in the stands to give to his daughter. That guy and his daughter didn't really realize the importance of this baseball. So a guy named John Spinolo is out there, and he's a real Giants fan, and he comes running and sprinting down to this this guy who got the home run ball and offers him $30 and says, I got a sick brother who would love to have this ball. But it turns out that John Spinolo knew that this ball was important. It was the Giants' 10,000th home run in their history. So he knows the team would want the ball and that they would invite whoever caught that ball to throw out the first pitch at a future game. He did have an 18-year-old brother, but he denied saying he was sick to try to get this ball. Spinolo, when interviewed, said, It may sound rude or whatever, but I couldn't tell this guy that this was the 10,000th home run. He never would have given it up. I said I had a little brother who wanted the ball, and I do. He also said, The guy was not a fan. He didn't know anything about it. Why should he get this honor? He didn't know what the ball was. This guy sounds like a real piece of work. (laughs) (laughs) And because he said all these things in the press, his name is all over the news, and everybody knows this guy's a jerk, and people start (laughs) going after him. I've read that people started calling his phone and harassing him because he basically stole this ball and this honor of throwing out the first pitch from a little kid. And I'm not really sure how it ended, but his name is all over the news and just admitting to some kind of shady behavior. I don't think he ended up throwing out the first pitch. I don't know if they ever found the little girl who should have thrown out the first pitch, but I don't think that this John Spinolo ended up getting that honor. But there's also another footnote. So all of that story, all of that local news intrigue about the villain of Giants fandom, it may have all been for naught. A few weeks later, a, a historian realized that there were 26 home runs hit by the Troy Trojans in the 1880s. And this team was a precursor to the Gothams, who then became the Giants. So after they added those in, the 10,000th home run was said to be hit by Will Clark. But there's more. In 2001, the Giants were about to hit their 12,000th home run. And some other baseball historians discovered that the Trojans were an entirely different franchise. And so those 26 home runs should not be counted. So then then this leads to the discovery that Ernie Riles actually only hit the 9,998th home run in franchise history. And Robbie Thompson actually hit the 10,000th home run. So 2001, this is discovered. That ball is probably long gone. But John Spadiolo and Ernie Riles' bat are sent to Cooperstown to for the honor of the 10,000th home run, but it turns out they weren't actually the 10,000th home run. So that guy was just a jerk to a kid for nothing. I'm sure he's proud of himself. For the season, Riles hit 294 with three home runs with the Giants to close out 1988. 1989, he was a valuable utility player for the National League champs playing in 122 games. He played in 83 games at third base, also slotted in at second base, shortstop, as well as left and right field. Hit 278 with seven homers and 40 RBIs, but unfortunately went 0 for the playoffs. 
In the regular season, Ernie had hit 293 against righties with seven home runs. The A's were starting two righties in game one and game two with Dave Stewart and Mike Moore. So Ernie got the start at DH and unfortunately went 0 for 7 in games one Mm. and two. 1990, he's used a little more sparingly, plays only 92 games, starts only 33, and only hits 200 for that year. However, he was very good as a pinch hitter. In his career as a pinch hitter, he hit 206 with six home runs. But in 1990, he hit 286 with four pinch hit home runs, which is still a giant single season record. After that season, he was kind of expendable, just a utility player who had just come off a a 200 season, but a good left-handed bat. And he's involved in a unique trade. Even though the A's and Giants are across the bay from each other, they rarely at this time made trades between the two teams. But Ernie was sent from the Giants to the A's in exchange for Darren Lewis. And the next trade between those teams wouldn't come for another 14 years in 2004. At the time of the trade, the A's didn't know it, but they were going to need a replacement for third baseman Carney Lansford. Yeah, Lansford injured himself in a snowmobile accident in late December and would miss all but five games in 1991. And so Ernie Riles and Vance Law were expected to replace Carney Lansford. Ernie started okay, and then after May 21st, he hit only 178 through the end of the season to close with a 214 average. And a July article said... Ernie Riles had the lowest fielding percentage of any position player in the majors. And he ends up getting granted free agency in the off season. As bad as that sounds, he wasn't terrible in this season for the A's. He ended up with a positive wins above replacement, but it didn't really look good on paper. He ends up signing with the Astros uh, for 1992. Hits 307 in AAA, but only plays 39 games in the big leagues is not re-signed, 1993, signs with the Red Sox. He makes the team and appears in 94 games, but hits only 189. Signs with the Angels in 1994, but due to the strike-shortened season, he never made a call-up to the majors and ends up calling it a career. Closing the book on Ernie Riles, 254 hitter with 48 home runs and 284 RBIs in 919 games. How about in retirement? Even as far back as 1988 at the, at the time of this card, he had a home in Georgia, and that's where he still lives. He's a coach and instructor. He shows up as a guest at camps with former pros, and he participates in charity golf outings and events with former teammates and friends. He and his wife, Carol, have three kids, Camry, Kelly, and TJ. All of those kids are outstanding athletes in their own right. TJ plays baseball. He played at East Carolina and then in independent league ball. And in 2020 winter ball, in an interesting twist, he was a teammate of Greg Vaughn Jr. Both of their dads played for the Brewers, but a year apart. Greg Vaughn came up in 1989, the year after Ernie was traded. But TJ still trying to make his way in professional baseball. Camry was an All-American gymnast at the University of Bridgeport. And Kelly played basketball at UNC Asheville for four years before playing professionally overseas in Germany, Sweden, and Turkey. And she currently works with the Atlanta Hawks, doing some development at camps, as well as working for a PR firm. Georgia has always been Ernie's home. And in his career, if you look at his splits, he hit markedly better against Atlanta than any other team. He hit 322 versus Atlanta, the only team that he had an average over 300 against. At Fulton County Stadium, he hit 352. So there really must have been something in that home cooking and, and being able to sleep in your own bed and then go to the park rather than stay in a hotel. As for Ernie's legacy, there are three Major League Baseball players born in Cairo. Jackie Robinson, Ernie Riles, and Willie Harris. In an interview, Willie Harris was asked about whether he was aware of Jackie Robinson as a kid. And he said, not at all. Jackie was born here, but his mom left when he was three and moved to California. In the next question, he is asked about the influence of Ernie Riles. And of course, those two names aren't often equated and they're not often used in the same sentence, except when talking about their hometown. And Willie said, Ernie had a huge influence on my life. Once he retired, he had a little Sunday league team. I was the youngest player by far. The talent level was high. Lots of people came to the games. 
I played in it from age 15 to my junior year of college. And those two answers offer a kind of juxtaposition of the big picture and small picture of baseball. Of course, Jackie Robinson is one of the most influential players in baseball history, hugely important historically and culturally significant. And even in Cairo and and in Georgia, Ernie Riles was quoted at a naming of a field where they named the field after Jackie Robinson. And it's a, a big deal to see that name and know that Jackie Robinson is from your hometown. But on the micro level and on the the small picture level of instilling a love of baseball and showing a kid like Willie Harris that a guy from Cairo can make it, Ernie Riles was a huge role model and hugely important. And this is a guy who lived and breathed baseball. His career was pretty good, played almost a decade in Major League Baseball, and now is passing that love of the game onto others and helping create a new generation of young players. And also, if he had anything to do with a 2005 World Series championship for my beloved Chicago White Sox, <laughs> Ernie Riles is a hero of the pod. <laughs> Absolutely. A, a great story, a great player, and a great history. So thank you, David, uh, for that. Thank you for this story. And thank you to Brian once again for joining us in the RBI Corner. And thank you to you at home. If you've ever become a villain by trying to rip off a kid, buy their home run ball off of them, uh, we'd love to hear from you on Twitter. I don't, we don't. We wouldn't. We wouldn't love to Actually, hear from you. We don't want to hear from you on Twitter, but you can find us at Tops1988. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>